I want to thank everybody for joining us here today with Living Room Conversations. And we're doing an experiment. This is our first online Living Room Conversation. And we've assembled uh, four folks from across the country to talk about what is freedom. And as we get started, just a little bit about Living Room Conversations, and then I'll turn it over to our guests. A Living Room Conversation is uh, where people from different political perspectives get together to talk about a topic that they have in comp that they want to learn more about somebody else's perspective. Two co-hosts will each invite two more friends and get together typically in a living room, but we're trying it online, and, uh, and then follow the conversation guidelines. So I uh, welcome you to look up livingroomconversations.org, check out over 20 sets of materials that are already created, or create your own, and have a lot of fun with this, as you'll see that we will today. And so uh, just to get started, I'm going to go ahead and uh, in introduce uh, the, our participants today. First off, off, we have Anita Jackson. Go ahead and say hi, Anita. Hi, everybody. And uh, we have Eleanor Lacane. Hello. Uh, we have Greg McQuirter. Good afternoon. And Issa Hodge. Hello, everybody. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, all the materials have been sent out to everyone ahead of time. So we're going to go ahead and just let uh, let the conversation happen much as it would in your living room. Thanks, everybody. So let's go ahead and get started by reading the ground rules. And uh, I went ahead and just typed them here into chat so people can, can do them. And if you guys will just hit, do a round robin and each read one and then repeat until we get to the end. OK, I can, I can start. Um, the first ground rule is to be curious and open to learning. Listen to and be open to hearing all points of view. Maintain an attitude of exploration and learning. Conversation is as much about listening as it is about talking. Thanks, Anita. Um, Eleanor, you want to yeah. go next? Show respect and suspend judgment. Human beings tend to judge one another. Do your best not to. Setting judgments aside will better enable you to learn from others and help them feel respected and appreciated. Go ahead, Greg. Look for a common ground in this conversation. We look for what we agree on and simply appreciate that we will disagree on some beliefs and opinions. And be authentic and welcome that from others share what's important to you. Speak authentically from your personal and heartfelt experience. Be considerate to others who are doing the same. Be purposeful and to the point. Notice if what you are conveying is or is not on purpose to the question at hand. Notice if you are making the same point more than once. Own and guide the conversation. Take responsibility for the quality of your participation and the quality of the conversation by noticing what's happening and actively support getting yourself and others back on purpose when needed. Great job, everybody. Are there any questions to the ground rules? Yeah, is is so basically it's a fair fight. There's no rabbit punches, no no kidney shots, right? <laughs> Keep everything above the waist, correct? <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, I think you and Eleanor are on the same page there. Uh, and just right, come mind on. It, you know, people All right, come on, stretch out. want to have some fun here as we uh, engage in this very uh, deep and heartfelt conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone to their corners. That's right. <laughs> All right, everybody. So there's five rounds of questions. I'm going to go ahead and start typing them into the chat, uh, you know, or pasting them into the chat one at a time in case you don't have materials available. And so just kind of uh, be, be cons as concise as you can. We're going to try and squish basically a two and a half hour conversation into about 60 minutes. So uh, let's, you know, keep it moving and don't uh, belay any labor, any points as we keep moving forward. So thanks, everybody. So I'm going to mute myself and let you guys take it from here And uh, because these are supposed to be self-facilitated. Have fun. No pressure, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. 
the future no of question. America rests on our shoulders. What are we going to do? <laughs> I think if we laugh, I think we're going to be fine. <laughs> I agree. If you joked, you know, uh, I think we'll entertain and, and get this apart, this uh, this across. So should we start with round two? Getting started. Why are we here? <laughs> Well, that would be round one, but oh, yeah. Sorry, I can't That's read. Okay. Was That's all right. That's what all right. interested you or drew you to this conversation? Uh, well, Bobby, Bobby begged me. He, he thought he th he thought he should have a bull fat white man on here. I don't know why, but that's what he asked for. So here I am. Who's Bobby? <laughs> uh, Rodrigo, at coffee party. Oh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm here because uh, you know, I was interested in the topics that was presented, and uh, I'm always interested in a, in a nice discussion. Uh, I don't always agree with everybody I talk to, uh, but I enjoy uh, listening to other people's opinions. I mean, that, that is the beauty uh, uh, you know, of where we live, uh, even though it's becoming increasingly harder uh, to enjoy those freedoms. But, uh, so that, that's why I'm here. Well, I'm here because I live in Washington, D.C., and the dialogue are the mutual coexisting monologues that are happening is ripping our country apart, and uh, it's disgusting to watch what happens and doesn't happen here every day. So we need something to kind of break through the gridlock of the Democrats versus the Republicans, and also we need to create spaces for the third of the country who don't agree with either the Democrats or the Republicans, but they seem to be pretty much cut out of the uh, most of the conversation. So that's why I'm here. Well, I'm I'm here because uh, Bobby uh, reached out to me, and I can't say no to Bobby. And uh, we we definitely are going down a very precarious road in this country with the divisiveness that we see like uh, Eleanor talked about and uh, we definitely need to start bringing people together one of the things that uh, this country lacks here recently we've gone away from the sense of community that we've had for that existed in this country many 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 years ago and now that sense of community is gone, and it's and it is uh, it's been polarized by so many uh, different organizations, and it's really hurting our country. And that's why I'm here. I'm here. I guess the short answer is because um, Joan Blades invited me, and um, but the the kind of <laughs> longer answer is that. I've been really interested in what she's been doing with living room conversations from the beginning. I thought it was really inspiring actually to see that she and Mark Meckler of the Tea Party who, you know, would have generally speaking it seems like they would be having really opposing viewpoints were able to come together and have a conversation and do so civilly and respectfully and um, I think it's a wonderful model. And I think just recognizing each other's humanity um, is is a great place to start. And so, so that's why I'm here. All right, what's round two question? Well, I, well, I, well, I, well, I think it's interesting that uh, that we all seem to have just here in the very beginning. We all seem to have uh, the same uh, mind mindset, if you would. So you know we, we don't have an antagonist with us. That's that's going to you know be interesting. We don't have somebody that seems to be right now the polar opposite. So I'm going to be a communist anarchist for this show, okay? So I could be opposite of all of you. So we're going to be socialist yet a hinge of anarchy with communism being the uh, overall you know totalitarian uh, uh, rulers over us. Okay, that's what I'm going to be advocating for this show. <laughs> So in other words, you're going to play the president. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, Redemlican. I mean, yeah, basically I'll be one of them. All right, all right. <laughs> so, uh, two. Anita, you want to you want to take, you want to kick us off there? Sure. So round two, 
answer one or more of the following. What sense of purpose or mission or duty guides you in your personal and or professional life? What would your best friend say about who you are and what makes you tick? And or what most concerns you about your community and or the country right now and long term? You didn't read the rest of what she said. <laughs> Somebody didn't know that I was joking, but that's, <laughs> that's okay. So go ahead, uh, Anita. What, what, what makes you tick? What makes me tick? Oh, okay. This is, it feels a little personal. This is good. That's good. It's a good place to start. Um, you know, I think that um, it, uh, we'll go, okay, we'll go back to my teenage college self, you know, where I, I came, um, I studied at, at Berkeley and I was really interested in studying about um, health, health and human rights and, um, you know, how people um, get to have and protect health and, um, you know, I, I was really passionate about it and um, had some really amazing professors from, you know, the UCSF medical school coming over through the anthropology department, you know, through all sorts of the public health school, um, and they helped me kind of form my own major in health and human rights. And um, I was going to this United Methodist Church at the time that I was really involved in, and um, you know, the the idea of um, you know walking the walk and what justice is and how you live that in the world and how you help people was really ingrained into me as a fundamental core value. And so after that I decided, okay, you know, how do I pursue this as in a career? And I had um, some professors who suggested, you know, law school would be a good thing. So I went to American University and um, continued to pursue studies in um, you know, in the law and got very passionate about international human rights there and about the Constitution and um, that was in DC 2000 to 2003 and so then I hightailed it back to the Bay Area because those were three kind of difficult years <laughs> in DC if you remember um, with 9-11 and the sniper and the blizzards and you know this and that and I came back to the Bay Area and was really really lucky to come back to a wonderful church community and meet with Joan Blades and move on and she was starting this new organization Moms Rising and it really that organization spoke to what I was um, you know thinking of in terms of supporting um, women and moms and families and health so um, I guess what those are the things that make me tick does that answer the question I hope I'm satisfied Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Greg? Oh, we, whoa. Maybe, you know, what, what if we went guy, girl, guy, girl, or That's should good. we gentlemen say ladies first, or should we show when to say men before the women, and children can fend for themselves? How should we do this? Should we, <laughs> man, like woman, guy, woman, man? Guy. Yeah, I like that too. Mix it up. <laughs> yeah. That works for me. Well, uh, I guess we're going to go with me next. Uh, it was, uh, for me, everything started, when I think about it, years ago as a kid. Um, I'm from a uh, mixed family. My mom is black. My dad's white. My mom's family's from the South. My dad's family's from the South. There, you know, uh, there's a long time ago where those kind of marriages were, illegal against the law and uh, when I was a kid growing up and had learned about that, that those kinds of things blew my mind and that touched me deeply and I, I kind of always thought about you know you know what an actual purpose of government is because I don't think it should be doing uh, limiting what people want and I was thinking about those things 14 years old in middle school you know I, I should have been eating mac and cheese at lunch and you know, stashing my Cheerios for breakfast for snacks, you know, I mean, I, but I was having those kinds of thoughts. And then the thing that really got me, uh, that got a lot of people, I think, was 9-11. And uh, 
just in the sense that there completely was a, even from the, the first day, I felt that there was a blanket of lies over what was going on and what everything that happened behind the scenes about 9-11. That really, I'll never forget where I was on that day. And that's what activated me politically was uh, there's one of the things that should not happen under any circumstance is our government should not lie to us. If our government lies to us, it's time for people to go to jail. And that's how I feel about it. And uh, I've, as 11 years as a police officer, I have uh, maintained those kinds of, that kind of outlook on everything I do and around the, the deputies around me. And so I hate to sound so cliche when I say change from the inside, but it takes someone, at least one person, to stand up and say, I will not abide by this. And that spreads. It spreads like wildfire. And we we have to motivate other people to do that together. And um, then came uh, my my work with Oath Keepers and really trying to to uh, turn around the perception of how people perceived Oath Keepers. And then Dan Johnson came into my life. And nothing has been the same. Um, <laughs> nothing has been the same since I've been working with Dan. And uh, I, my, my ability to go out there and to bring real facts to people, and to bring, to bring reality to people, things that people haven't seen and don't know what's going on. It, it's just been, you know, multiplied many, many times over, and. So I'm happy to be a participant in one of these things. And besides, those are the things that, that I've talked about. My, my biggest thing is I'm a father of four. And uh, one of the things that I have approached parenting that has affected my political activity is trying to give my children the opportunities and a life better than I had. And... When we go through life, that doesn't just include what kind of job you have or making sure your kids go to college or anything like that. That's also trying to make the, the, the community and the country that they're uh, part of better for them too. We got to leave it better than how we found it is how I approach things. Eleanor. Yes, I'm the girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely isn't me with this beard, so yes. <laughs> and I have hair on top of my head. <laughs> That's true. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> um, well, I would say probably I became politically activated when I was in college. And I was very moved by the um, people in Africa dying of hunger. It was in the Sahel and also in Bangladesh and India. And it just seemed to me unfair that some people were dying of hunger in a world of plenty. And then when I looked more into it, to see that we had a lot of hunger even in the United States. And that about one in five children in the United States are growing up hungry. So I thought, well, why is anybody hungry when we have so much food in the world? So when I kind of looked into that, I went, well, it's, who's got the money? Because rich people don't starve. And then the, looking at the whole system, the food system in the U.S. and the world, how it works and the uh, how so much of it is oriented for corporations to be able to make as much money as they can no matter who gets hurt along the way. So I would say that it was that doorway of looking at why why is there hunger in a world of plenty and if you follow that thread you learn a lot of things about what's wrong with our country and our world that 
doesn't have to be. That if we make other choices and move in other directions, we can have a quality of life for everybody, a better quality of life for everybody. So that's what I'm motivated to try and make better quality of life for all Americans and in a way that's kind of responsible globally. Wow. Um, I don't think I could top any of that. Uh, all you guys started your activism in, in, in college. I'm going to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, I'm a product of the 80s. Um, self-involved, self-absorbed. Uh, it was a good era, to be honest <laughs> with you, to be white in America. Um, you know, profitable. Education was quick and easy for me, you know. Uh, that's all I cared about, uh, you know, unfortunately. Um, and it wasn't until actually uh, in college uh, when I took what I thought was an easy course in college for some some easy grades, uh, some easy college credits, uh, that uh, I was introduced, uh, I took world religion, and I was introduced, even though I grew up in New York, I was around Hindus, Sikhs, Hasidic Jews, every kind of Christian you can think of growing up. Never really paid much attention to the religion, just thought it was culture aspect to me, to be honest with you. Then I was introduced to what, you know, what makes people, you know, their faiths. And, and this is where uh, I was introduced to um, a lot of faiths. Behind me, you can see lots of books that I've studied over, I'm going to tell my age here, 21 years now. Um, <clears throat> so I'm old. But, uh, so, uh, and this is where I was introduced to Islam, it became Muslim, and that's probably the birthplace of my uh, involvement of, of politics, you know. Uh, it was still quite subtle, still uh, still enjoying um, the, the benefits and the perks uh, for being white in America, to be honest with you, because, I mean, that's what we have going on. And uh, But, you know, with what was going on in the Clinton administration, um, you know, in Bosnia and, and, and Lithuania, um, and then I think 9-11, I've heard this mentioned a couple of times here. This was kind of the awakening for a lot of us. And for me as a Muslim who, who studied these religions, um, especially Islam, I, I saw this. And before there was any architects and engineers for truth on 9-11, before there was any, you know, engineer reports of molten lava and molten steel and, you know, all this stuff, the, the minute – uh, ironically, two hours after the event happened, uh, it was immediately blamed on the religion of Islam and Muslims and things of this nature. Um, I knew it was false at that point. Um, so I got involved in local things here uh, in, in my area to help try to spread the truth about it, that, that these people, if they said is true, hijacked this faith. Um, fast forward, I still was still was not really too involved until one day I got tired of trying to explain my faith and, and teach people you know what my faith really is and um, everybody wanted to talk about terrorism they want to talk about women's rights they want to talk about you know and, and that's all they wanted to talk about even though I know that uh, you know one in three women are raped in this country I know that you know f you know uh, one out of four women are, are, are murdered by their abusive spouse I mean so Every culture, every faith, every there's there's idiots in every ideology, every culture, every religion. But I got tired of people coming to ask me about religion, about my religion, but really wanted to talk about terrorism. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't study terrorism in college. I didn't study it in the, in the Quran. I didn't study it in the Bible. I didn't study terrorism anywhere. And so I made a decision that I wasn't going to talk about it anymore. That when people came to ask me about it, I wasn't going to speak to them about it. So uh, one old man and his elderly man in his late 50s early 60s came and and uh, kept asking me about that and I finally had enough and I kind of blew a fuse a little bit and I said uh, can I see your Ku Klux Klan card he said excuse me I said well you heard me I want to see your Ku Klux Klan card you're an older white gentleman Christian faith so I'm gonna assume that you're a Klansman and he says that's utterly ridiculous I said exactly it's utterly ridiculous for me to think that you as an older white gentleman Christian faith as a clan member as it is for you to think that I'm a terrorist or that I know anything about terrorism. All right. It was epiphany to me. Uh, uh, a nurse practitioner. I, 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 I work on saving lives. That's what I do. I own a clinic in an urban area. That's my passion. So 
when I go to treat a disease, I don't treat the symptoms, I treat the disease. I fight the disease. So this is the birth of my political activism. Is I knew that 9-11 was the catalyst for 14 years of them taking the number one spot in America of the enemy to America, African Americans, to Muslims being the number one enemy of America. And Muslims are going to be used for trillions of our dollars and several of our citizens being used to die overseas and infinite number of civilians killed overseas. So I decided to create the Million American March Against Fear 9-11 on 9-11 knowing that Fox News and mainstream media was going to have a heyday. How dare these Muslims march on 9-11? The one day a year Muslims do not have a right to speak. I asked a simple question. If you're going to say that on that day I as a Muslim American have no right to freedom of assembly and freedom of speech, well, then every white person in America better stop celebrating Martin Luther King Day. There better not be one German, not one German going to the Holocaust Museum in D.C., we're going to paint a broad brush. Let's be, uni let's be universal with this here. So this has kind of been my battle. Is you know basically pointing, uh, you know, showing common sense to this, and and this was the birth of it, and then and, and subsequently caused it, caused the uh, my show, a Muslim and American wake up, uh, Muslim and a Catholic wake up in America. That's right, America. But the problem is this, in the community. I'm talking about within the Muslim community, but I'm, I'm talking about within the American community. I don't care what somebody else's faith is. I don't care what your ideology is. I don't care what your life's choices are. I don't care about all of that. But it seems like everybody else does, and this is the problem that we have. Everybody is so busy worried about what everybody else is doing that while we're busy looking at each other, fearing each other, hating each other, you know, you know, finding ways to try to close borders, kick you out, boot you out, kill you, whatever, alienate you, ostracize you, villainize you. I can go on and on and on with words here. While we're busy as a people doing this, there is an entity. I don't care if you want to call them Masons. I don't care if you want to call them neocons, government, uh, 1%. They, they, they love all the names we give them. We're going to call it them because it's us against them, all right? That's a very simple way. I don't care if they're moon men from Mars or some people think that Obama's a lizard man from another planet. Fine. If that's what you want to call them, call them that. I'm going to call it us versus them because them have all the money. And I know it's incorrect <laughs> grammar there, but them have everything, okay? <laughs> them have all the money. Them have all the power. Them have all the corporations. Them have everything. We are providing everything for them because while we're busy fighting one another, I don't care if you like my faith. I'm going to go to bed tonight, sleep sound, wake up in the morning, God willing, and I'm going to go back and save more people's lives and go back to bed the night before. And I'm going to do this again and again and again until my time is up. So that's the I answered two of them. I think I think I think I covered it. And just for clarification, who is the them? Is that you're thinking like the one percent? Yeah, that yeah, that's them. Yeah, them is the one percent. We're talking about Halliburton's, RKBs, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think we're ready for round three. I think it's Greg's turn to kick us off on that one, right? Well, yep. Round three, the first question there, what does freedom mean to you? And that, trying to compress this into 60 minutes, we could all take 60 minutes on that topic each. Um, freedom to me is everything you see, you know, that's supposed to be guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Freedom to me is the right for me to live my life how I please as long as I don't, I'm, I'm not hurting anyone. Um, freedom to me is my freedom of choice. Um, I, for example, a hot topic issue right now, I am very anti, or I'm sorry, I'm very against abortion for me and my family. However, I am pro a woman's choice. And if a woman and her family and their creator and that's for that individual, then they can. And I'm not going to go and protest that woman's right to make her decisions. And I am – so those – that's what freedom is to me. Freedom is to be able to do – and it's kind of a very libertarian kind of kind of outlook, but be able to just live your life peacefully uh, however you want it. You know, uh, one of uh, my wife, who's very, very, very uh, – 
uh, left leaning, but she agrees, and she has sent me a meme, and it says, uh, "It said, let the gays get married, let the rednecks have their guns, let the atheists be atheists, and the Christians be Christians. America should be about freedom, freedom to live your life how you please. So smoke a bowl, eat a greasy burger, shoot your guns, praise Jesus, and wish those two fellas next door a happy honeymoon. And that's exactly how I feel like it should be. Um, I'm not gay, but my neighbors, if they're gay, ha hey, are you good? Are you good people? Are you throwing your trash in my yard? That's what's going to, you know, bring more of an issue to me, you know, rather than their their choice of sexuality. And I feel like that all these labels um, is the design by them um, to keep us divided. To to withdraw that sense of community because I my I have a feeling and this is just what I believe from you know my studies of, of history trying to get to the facts of history and that is a hundred years ago uh, uh, we were defrauded uh, with the uh, with the establishment of the Fed and that completely changed the course of this country forever. And if we were to go back before then, something like 9-11, something huge that, that killed thousands of, of American people, we would have, the people would have torn Washington to the ground if they felt their government lied to them. And so many people feel like their government has lied to them over that, but yet we're not doing anything about it. So we got a lot to do with this country and bringing back freedom. Um, not that I'm anti-government. Let me be clear. I'm not anti-government. I'm very unintrusive government. And uh, even as a police officer, you know, uh, I was very, you know, hey, when I was training people, treat people with respect. Uh, if you got a question of whether or not you should do something, if you can go in that house, if you can search that car, if you don't know, go get a warrant. Because you already know the answer. If you don't know, go get a warrant. And to you know, any kind of law is government force. And increasingly, we're seeing more government force. And those kind of things put freedom at risk. And with my chosen career, with how I look at things as a individual, how I look at things politically, or how I look at things as a as a parent. Um, those are the things that we definitely need to put a put the brakes to, put a stop to. And you know, growing up, I grew up a uh, inner city kid, poor. Uh, uh, my dad wasn't around. My mom took care of us, raised us, and, she, and luckily for me, she raised us to be open minded and free thinking, and to not always just accept things the way they are, and that you can actually. Um, work your way out of them. I dream has been sold. The American dream is gone. It's been sold by them. And we have we got a lot of work to do to get it back. Now on the same note, I feel like I'm the product of the American dream. Um but on this but in a sense I can see it even growing up, you know, in the eighties and nineties, I can see it slowly going away. And the, I think the thing that saddens me most, and I'll, I'll get off my soapbox because I could talk about that for a while, is the uh, is the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act. And uh, the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act has hurt our country immensely. And uh, but we we could talk about that later. Anita. Okay. Or is it, wait a minute, or is it Eleanor? Is it Eleanor? It's Eleanor. Sorry. Eleanor next? No, yeah, go, ahead. Is that, <laughs> go ahead, Anita. Is that the way we're going? I don't know. Go ahead. Anita, you're on. Okay. Eleanor, go ahead. Is it Eleanor? Okay, I'm seeing Debbie Lynn has a, a there's an arrow presenting. I'm just, do, I'm just doing it on purpose. I'm, I'm messing with Debbie Lynn. It's a, <laughs> Hit between Anita and, and, and it, it, we just I, I thought we were gonna go Greg, Eleanor, me, Anita, and then you know we were doing that last time. Circle. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. 
I'm getting the note from Debbie Lynn. Okay, I'll go. Um, but I understand, Eleanor, you know, sort of the reluctance because this is kind of getting into the meat of the conversation. And, um, and it does feel challenging. When I was thinking about this question, oh, there's so many levels to it for me. You know, on a personal level, you know, freedom's the ability to, you know, health is part of my definition of freedom. You know, I'm able to walk around, I'm able to take care of my kids, you know, pretty easily. I'm able to drive a car and, um, you know, read and write and speak and, um, you know, be in my community and hold a job and earn a paycheck and, you know, marry my husband who is white, you know, and that is actually something we, we definitely, um, you know, gave thanks for during our wedding, <laughs> that freedom. Um, so there's that kind of personal day-to-day -day level appreciation that I have of the freedom that I can exercise. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, unaware and ungrateful of the fact that I, I can do so many of those things because of the way we protect so much freedom in this country um, and that it's different in other places. Um, I was the first in my family to be born in the States and you know I think about that often um, and what would have happened, how you know things would have been different had I been born in another country or you know if my parents hadn't had you know been sent to another country or immigrated to another country um, you know I like might have been Australian, I might have been British, depending on where they went. Um, so I, I, I have a, a, an appreciation on both that kind of personal level and then more at like the systemic level. What does freedom, what does freedom mean? Um, a great respect, I have a great respect for the Constitution and um, gratitude for it and it's always interesting to me to see how it gets interpreted and um, you know how the actual freedoms enumerated in the Bill of Rights are exercised or not in this country you know where are they paused why are they paused um, so those conversations are really interesting to me too having studied human rights I think a lot of um, President Roosevelt and his 1941 Four Freedoms speech, um, freedom of speech and religion, freedom from want and from fear, and um, you know I, I think it's really interesting that at that point in history he chose to give this speech um, enumerating particular rights, some that you know we hold dear as a country and others that are more you know, speaking more about economic rights that in the United States um, is a little bit, you know, that, that's I think a little bit more of where um, legislators come to a head and people disagree about, um, you know, how, how we exercise those sorts of freedoms and, you know, so that, that's, that's kind of at the systemic level for me. Um, how I think about it and where I'm interested in in the conversation about freedom. Um, I, I really appreciated one of you was maybe you said earlier bringing up the idea of truth and um, you know how we have to really look at what's true and you know how many of our freedoms are based on truth and how important that is. Um, you know, I think good policy comes from looking at good data. Um, I was thinking about it, Greg, when you were talking about the choice issue, which is a whole other issue. I'm sure they've had whole living room conversations just about about abortion. And I was just, you know, thinking about, you know, whether, you know, people's beliefs about that um, are one thing and how you exercise your belief about it is one thing and then the facts are you know that women have abortions and whether they're legal or not like we know that that's a fact and you know 
you can look at the data and see are people safer when they're legal? You know, do people go underground and get them anyway and die? You know, and and so when we talk about freedoms and limiting freedoms because of certain beliefs versus the data, um, you know, that feels like it can be dangerous to me. Um, and so I really appreciate when we're able to have these open conversations and talk about um, what's true and then talk about how we protect rights and promote freedom um, based on those, you know, based on good data and based on, you know, how people live their lives in real life. Good. So. Hmm. I think I, I think uh, everybody's pretty much covered uh, freedom for me. Um, anyway, so I think everybody's pretty much covered freedom for me. I, I agree with both what uh, Anita and and Greg both said as far as freedom. Um, I'm sure everybody out there that's going to be listening is thinking, oh, it's a Muslim and he's got the Sharia, you know that that scary word Sharia, and what does it you know, say, uh, you know, Sharia is for me. It's 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 how I guide my life. It can, you know, it contains everything from how I speak and and treat these people here that are not Muslims, how I work with them, how I barter and trade, how I do business, how I treat my parents. It covers every aspect. No different than the Bible has the same. It has very specific laws in it that that treat, teach us how. Uh, teach Christians how to treat and how to deal with people and, and talk with people and things of this nature. But how it relates to freedom is simply this, is that how can any Muslim in America, 7 to 10 million of us, how can we begrudge anybody their freedoms when that freedom gave me the right to choose to become Muslim? The First Amendment gave me the right to go from Christian to Muslim by my own choice. And allowed me to go to college, allowed me to you know, start my business, have an education, do these things. Allows me to have this conversation with these fine people today and do the things that I've done. You know, um, So freedom, they've covered. And, and for me, I'm all about freedom. I'm all about freedom to the extent, and this is where I think, I don't know, I want to cover the gray area. Because the gray area, I think, is the sticking point that they like to use to divide us. And we're talking about them again, guys. Okay, That's what we're talking about. We're talking about them again. All right, them use <laughs> they like to use that gray area as a way to divide us, and the problem is is when is freedom too much? I like Greg. I personally do not agree with homosexuality. That means I'm not going to be gay, but because I believe that for my religious purpose. Now, if somebody who's gay were to ask me, "What do you think about homosexuality?" I would give them my religious aspect. But before then, I would tell them, you don't really want my opinion on this, okay? But it's my it's my opinion. Now, you you want to borrow my lawnmower? Just put the gas back in it. You borrowed from it, okay? You want to be treated at my clinic? Come on in. You want to work together on a you know constitutional issue, whatever, let's go. But don't ask me that question because I'm going to give you my opinion, and it's going to relate to what I feel for me. Now, that's the beauty of America. That's freedom, is that at the same time as I do not agree with your ideology or I do not agree with your political stance or your personal life choice, I can still work with you. I can still treat you. I can still treat you like a human being because ultimately that's what we all are regardless and, and at the end is when everything will be decided. And this even includes our atheists. I don't know if we have any atheists on the panel here tonight, but there may be some listening. This includes them as well. But it's all about respecting humans. I think the gray area that we run into, and I, we may, I may get some some disagreements on this, but the gray area, I think, is that there's too much freedom sometimes. And what I mean by that is, and, and I know I'm going to get some disagreements, but just, 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 just be patient for a second here, okay? You may agree. I don't know. Too much freedom is when others' rights infringe upon me. This is where I have a problem, all right? Because this is where we, and, and this is where the libertarian in me comes out is you are free to live your life as you see fit. I just don't want to infringe it upon me. I'm not going to make out in front of my wife. I don't want you making out in front of me. All right? I don't want to see that. I'm going to turn my head. I'm not going to come up to you and bash you over there and say, hey, you're violating my right. Stop it. But at the same time, I don't want to see that. It's not my business what you do. I don't care if it's a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, a man and a man, a man and a dog, a man and a horse, a cow, or whatever. I don't want to see it, period. I don't want to see it. I don't want to know about it. Okay? 
But and I, I think that they use this gray area. And I'm talking about them again, they again. They use this area to push these hot topics. Uh, Greg mentioned abortion earlier. You know, uh, we, we, we've talked about homosexuality. I mean, the list, I mean, there are key hot topic subjects that we have that they like to constantly throw up on our face, particularly when they want to sign a certain bill. And there was one thing I said, <laughs> I hope I don't offend anybody, all right? I hope I don't offend anybody on this, but this is a, a true comment. I mean, no disrespect to anybody when I say this, but the entire country was fighting over fags and flags and the fast track of the T, you know, with the TPP which, right through. While we were all worried about whether this man can marry this man, who cares? They want to be miserable like the rest of us married people? Go do it. <laughs> and flags. All of a sudden, now the Confederate is an issue. And everybody forgets what this flag behind me stands for. Over 239 years, of, or out of 239 years, 212 of them, we've been at war. The hundred, hundreds of millions of Native Americans that have been massacred under that flag. Now, I love that flag. It's why the flag is there. But it's upside down because we are in a state of distress. I love my country. I love my freedoms. I love the Constitution. But still... Yes, that's right, Greg. It's a battle flag. So we're fighting over these things, homosexual rights and, and flags, while we're having our environment stripped from us. I mean, this is how dangerous the TPP is. And it, yet they use these hot topics. And this is the gray area. Because what they will do is the, with these hot topics is they will give extra freedoms. They will pay money into it. They will help to bolster it in order to cause this division, this rift. You know, they'll show disproportionate favoritism towards one versus the other, you know, in order to continue the divisiveness. So I think that that's the area that for us who are freedom lovers, uh, and I do love freedom, I think we should have the right to find things. I think that it is a God-given right, not that piece of paper, though I love the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't give me the right to choose my faith. The Constitution doesn't give me the right to speak. God gave me that when he when when I was when I was created, and that's something that no piece of paper that can be written by a police officer or a judge or a politician can write away or take away. Period. Eleanor. Okay. Um, freedom. I would say. You know, I love the United States, and part of what I love about the United States is the the whole concept on which we're founded that power derives from the consent of the governed, and that no matter what particular issue we may need to be grappling with over time, whether it's a foreign enemy or how to deal with gays, um, or any of the environment, whatever the issue might be, that we have a system in place by which we the people can come together and address it through Congress, with the President, and through the Supreme Court. However, when we look at what is the risk to freedom today, I think the greatest risk to freedom today is that the very foundation by which decisions are made in the United States has totally become distorted by people with money, by people with a lot of money. In terms of who's going to run to be a member of Congress or anyone even now at the state level, it often largely depends on who can raise the most money and who's got the billionaires backing them. So our very number of candidates running is distorted by money. And then once they're in Congress, what is on the agenda and what gets passed is so heavily influenced by the very wealthy and, and it's really it's distorted it and uh, what Issa just said you know people were fighting about fags and flags while they were pushing through the TPP which you know opens the floodgates for corporations to be operating worldwide without interference, including overruling national sovereignty. Um, so that, I think, is our greatest threat to freedom, is the distortion and the power of money that's distorting our political system that was set up correctly to be able to address all these issues and to be a more level playing field. But it's so distorted by money now, 
we can't really have a fair a level playing field for who's going to run or what the agenda is once people get into Congress or once they run for and win the presidency. So that's my greatest concern. And whatever issue we might care about, whether it's guns or religion or uh, human rights or the environment and climate change, we will not successfully address most of these issues until we address the cancer underlying all other cancers, which is the distorting power of money in our political system right now. And I'm not exactly sure how we counter that because it's so pernicious, it's so pervasive, it's so deep and it's so powerful now. I don't really know an effective strategy for fighting back. We can try to repeal Citizens United. We can try to use uh, mobilize large numbers of people in voting to counteract the influence of money, but it's uh, until we successfully address that, the America we knew and love is no longer there, and we need to fight and reclaim that essence for America so then we can fight about everything else on a fair playing field in Congress and elsewhere. Nice. Now we're now we're at uh, round four, right? Looks like it. It looks like we're at round four. So uh, last time we we start we started with a gentleman last time, so we're going to start with Eleanor this time. I yes, just Eleanor. talked. I know. You're doing <laughs> all right, all right. Bring it on. What's the question? <laughs> well, it says here I in one second. Yeah, I'll read they, the oh, good. Then I don't have to speak to her. Round four. What are we learning here? Uh, answer one or more of the following. In one sentence, share what was most meaningful or valuable to you in the experience of this living room conversation. What learning, new understanding, or common ground was found on this topic? Has this conversation changed your perception of anyone in this group, including yourself? Who's up? Oh, okay. I thought I got a pass because I was reading it. Uh, no pass. All right. What was most meaningful and valuable in the experience? Well, I would say um, I love the deep sharing, and I felt that all of us showed up at the table, and Anita, you started us in a personal and deep way and kind of set a good tone. So I feel like everyone was speaking authentically and honestly about our experience and I love that. I think we just don't have enough of that in the country. Um, and I feel like we all had a good respect for our common humanity. In terms of what I, um, some of the common ground I think is our concern about our very democracy and about the influence of uh, the very wealthy. Um, Although, Anita, I don't think you've spoken directly to that. I have a feeling you would agree. I saw a little nodding along the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I would say we are kind of in agreement that's a fundamental core problem for the country right now. And that a lot of the divisions we think we have as Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or Independents um, actually get so overshadowed by that uh, that it d distorts the entire political conversation. And um, in terms of where I, my perception might have changed, where I learned, I, Issa, I was moved when you spoke about talking with people about being a Muslim and comparing that of if people assume you're a terrorist because you're a Muslim, then the parallel would be assuming you're in the Ku Klux Klan because you're white. And, you know, some of those ignorant and uninformed assumptions that people make about each other, uh, you know, sometimes kind of an in-your-face comparison like that can be very clarifying. So I uh, appreciate that. And I'm realizing I don't really have any Muslim friends. I have lots of very different kinds of friends. I have friends all across the political spectrum, all across, you know, class, rich, poor, everything in between. But I don't, and uh, artists and scientists, but I don't think I have any really 
not any close Muslim friends, so I, I'm grateful for the opportunity for that conversation, so thank you. You're welcome. I think I think in uh, well thank well I, since since you pointed me out I, maybe I'll go next here thanks Eleanor for that that's uh, that's uh, that's very nice I, you know um, the one thing that I learned from this is what you, what you just did right there one of the things that every time I deal with with these bigots every time I deal with these 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 I'm gonna keep it PG these idiots <laughs> okay uh, that are 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 are, are Pay provocateurs or or just ignorant to to what's important to humanity. Sometimes it could be a bit down, but then I get to meet people um, that remind me. Uh, we've mentioned we've done a few name we've done a few name drops here. Uh, Bobby Rodrigo, Daniel Johnson, for example, and then you guys. Um, I have never met any of you before. Never spoken to any of you before. And uh, I would have to say this is probably the, one of the most comfortable conversations I've had. And it always makes me feel better about what I try to do because then I think, eh, maybe the human race isn't so lost. Because look, I just found some more good people. <laughs> so maybe it's not time to buy that island and go ahead and move out there and just let humanity drown itself. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and stick in this fight because look, there's some more good people. That maybe they don't agree. I mean, we haven't even touched that. They might not agree with my faith. And that's fine. And I think that's important for those that are watching this. Uh, we don't have to agree with each other's ideologies of faith and, and belief. We don't have to believe that. But we have to believe that we're all human. I mean, I don't see any any horns growing out of any of their heads or a tail reaching up and scratching them every now and then. I don't see anything like that. So we're all human beings. So I, I think that that's what's important. I think that we just take within ourselves, oh, there's the horns, too late. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody put the horns on. <laughs> Well, excluding Eleanor on that, just about the, the other two there, I think that we're all human, you know. Um, and to be honest with you, I mean, nothing really changed uh, uh, as far as my perception, to be honest with you. Um, it just helped to quantify uh, my belief that there are still good people out there that maybe doesn't agree with me for whatever reason, um, but um, will at least laugh at my stupid jokes. That's a I will. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll go next. Um, you know, I I have so much hope. You know that, as Issa and Eleanor were saying, that we can have these conversations. You know, if we were to talk, you know, a little longer and get more deeply into our beliefs about um, policy and what next steps should be for the country on X, Y, and Z issues. We might disagree, but we can at least know that, you know, we're all humans. We all, you know, we're not trying to tear things apart. We actually are all looking for solutions and that we can talk with each other and maybe in that communication we can find solutions that work best for everyone, maybe better than any of us bring to the table because we can, you know, take the best from everybody. And right now it feels like, you know, the kinds of ideas that get shared and that get the spotlight are not necessarily the ones that are solutions oriented or even humanity oriented, but, you know, what's, what's going to get the most uh, ratings on TV, what's going to get the most ratings on radio, you know, what's going to appease the, the billion dollar donors as a few folks here have talked about. That to me is what concerns me about our democracy because I think this is democracy. You know, the people speaking with each other and, you know, looking honestly at where our country is and, you know, what do we see as issues or not issues, what do we see as possible solutions. Um, that's how we move forward. So my hope is that this model of living room conversations, you know, continues to grow and that we all can, you know, encourage friends to participate and maybe, you know, regrow that belief that, you know, this democracy can work and that we can have 
you know, grassroots power, which is what was intended and what was so beautiful about this country is that the people can govern themselves. And um, and I, I just I find great hope in that. I, I feel like a lot of the work that I do is about hopefully like finding ways to tip the balance a little bit, you know, to people who, you know, everyday people who might not have um, billions of dollars but still have a vote, you know, and have a voice. Um, so I'm grateful to participate in that, in this, um, for those ends. Craig? Well, I guess the most meaningful thing for me today is I met a bald white Muslim. Hey! But, that, but uh, I, being from Indianapolis, we have a, on the west side of Indianapolis, we have a huge uh, Muslim population, a lot of Somali immigrants. And then on the east side of Indianapolis, and probably uh, we could talk about this a whole nother a whole nother hour is we have uh, the Nation of Islam, and they. I have a lot of Nation of Islam friends, and they. The sense of community that they are bringing to the inner city is huge. It's huge, and say people can say what they want about it. They are primarily concerned with developing their communities. And they don't care necessarily if you're Muslim or if you're Catholic or if you're Jewish. If you're part of their community, they want you to be a part of their community, making their community better. And that, and while we have seen all kinds of rhetoric from their leadership, just like we would see rhetoric from Democrat or Republican leadership, the people on the ground have a completely different ideology and they're just developing their communities and that is something that I am seeing here with everyone here we have to develop our communities I th and there are lots of ways that we're gonna that we can do that from talking to them and getting getting some of them on on the side of the little guy the guys who are out here making 12 bucks an hour just barely struggling to get by and you know getting by and then taking with our lawmakers and reinstating something that's very mean to me the glass thing opinion sent this country down the road that it's on right now and so many things have happened that we we see it and it takes people like this group to bring other people together and to get something done about them. And that right there is very meaningful to me. And that's and that is how uh, more of these conversations are going to help us get something done. Nice. I guess we're at round five. And uh, that one is there, uh, basically says, is there a next step you would like to take based upon the conversation you just had? Uh, I think there was a little bit more to that. If I'm not mistaken, there were two items in that, unless you shorten it for time there, uh, Debbie Lynn. But is there, a, uh, what is the, what is one important thing you thought was accomplished here? Unless, I think we pretty much covered that last one, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We also even talked on that one there as well. Is there a next step? Uh, we would like to uh, take based, and Anita kind of touched on that as well, to see this type of conversation grow. I, I think that uh, this is what needs to happen. We need to have a civilized, uh, you know, education, educated, uh, emotionless conversations in a sense. I mean, I think that when people get emotionally charged, they use emote words that tend to be um, aggressive, and they tend to put people on the defense. Um, I surely... Uh, enjoy a good debate from time to time, but the minute that uh, they start to attack me or or my belief based upon emotion and not stats and facts, I mean I lose interest in that. I mean, and then there's nothing accomplished. Sometimes the best things accomplished are to agree to disagree. Sometimes that's the best accomplishment that you can actually get from your fellow human being on this planet is to agree to disagree. Um, 
but you can't even get to that point if you're busy name calling and you're busy attacking and vilifying and and uh, you know basically buying into the to the dividing conquer conquer tactics of, of of you know those those guys you know the ones that we've been talking about today you know the them the they the one percent you know. Uh, when we buy into that, that's what happens to us. Is that we uh, tend to do that. So I think, I think the next step is is to. Uh, I mean, I think that for those of us, for each of us that do our our individual activism and, and things that we do, I think we all have the good mindset. I mean, we didn't get a chance to really talk about uh, deep rooted ideologies and things like that to to really test it. I think this is the first time they're doing this, so they didn't get a really chance to to, to test the uh, well, what is it deep down. Uh, ideologies, and let's see how these uh, educated adults behave themselves, or whether they just start slinging poo and, you know, scratching themselves like chimpanzees or something. You know, <laughs> that's what I feel like when I talk to idiots sometimes. But, uh, but uh, anyways, uh, I, I think the next step is to, uh, is for this to continue to happen. I think individually, uh, for us and in the individual things that we do, is that we 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 take the parameters of this, and and we should try it. That's what I think we should do. We should try this in our own personal lives. I think we should try something like this uh, within our individual things, whether it's a show we do or, you know, or, or articles that we do. I mean, whatever it is that we do to help try to awaken the uh, the masses um, to this. That, that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> I appreciate that we have cleared that low bar, <laughs> Issa, of not <laughs> flinging poo at each other. That's good. <laughs> I am happy with that. It's, I'm impressed with all of us. We have managed to not do that. So it's for not me, such a low bar anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's true, too, actually. Um, next steps. I, um, you know, I, I appreciate, Isa, you, you kind of taking up that thought that we could all do this in our own communities and you know, reach out to people that, that we know. And, um, you know, now that I think we've seen this format and how it works, we have the ability to, um, you know, maybe get people to trust us and, and give it a try and know that we're all going to respect each other's humanity at the end. And I think that's a great first step. I'd also love to see, um, you know, maybe folks who do have their own, uh, you know, network TV show, um, do something that's not like hardball or, you know, a thing where people with opposing views are screaming at each other. Um, but maybe they should try the living room conversation format. You know, maybe they, who knows, maybe the American public is tired of seeing all the fighting and really wants to see solutions. I mean, I think there's plenty of polling that shows that people say they would like that. And if we can get, um, you know, people uh, in elected officials, um, folks who have a platform, you know, that's seen by millions and millions to give it a try, um, that would be a huge step. I think we do need to see some leadership in, in that sense, and this is such a wonderful format. Well, um, I have to agree with you on the leadership part, uh, because we have a lack of it. Um, we have a lot of people out there who are, and unfortunately these are the thems, uh, you know, some circles that I run in called the, uh, the powers that be. And uh, they are just to increase their power, their wealth. And we have, we have let them take the reins. Before this, we were uh, a country uh, by the people, for the people. And we let them take the reins, in my opinion, we let them take the reins in 1913. And when we let, by a very slim margin, uh, let the Fed be established and where a private entity can loan us our own money with interest, that completely took away the freedom of the American people. And 
we we need to use things like this to proliferate knowledge and to proliferate the idea of freedom to get out there that no I I might not agree with uh, we'll just go back to an abortion or even someone else might not agree with the idea of private gun ownership but these are freedoms that we were born with endowed by our creator and government should be there to protect those freedoms and not to enumerate them but just to say this is your freedom and this is what we're going to limit it to no we were all born with the God-given right to speak we all are born we were all born with the God-given right to call God by whatever name we call God and government should be there to protect them and not limit them and not to to divide us like it has and if it's through these conversations that we're going to expand people's minds and they need to happen more and more often every day okay well um I in very much enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I still have a lot of concerns in terms of the country when you get, um, as Anita was saying, the media focusing on the fighting instead of the solutions. And I know we're stepping already into the 2016 presidential race, and there'll be a uh, billion dollars spent or more in political ads um, kind of to attack and divide. Uh, and make people turn off to the other guy and the other party or to politics altogether. So, um, and I'm concerned about, you know, what I saw in Congress and the way I saw it was when Obama came in, the Republicans strategically deciding the night he was inaugurated to not give him any victories as a president. And that was a strategic decision that they've been operative on for the past six years to the destruction and detriment of the country. So I think those are very big concerns still, but um, better to light one candle and to curse the darkness. And I think if in terms of a next step, what I would see is each of us taking kind of the openness and respect of this conversation into other conversations that we have, you know, hopefully that can have a positive ripple effect. So I'll end on that hopeful light the candle metaphor. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everybody for your uh, very thoughtful and, and respectful conversation today and I personally also learned so much and uh, cannot wait until we actually get this video released and we can share that with others and all of you have made that possible for us. And um, I did hear some commitments there about continuing on these conversations, so feel free to email me uh, so that we can have more of these conversations in in real time in, with real people in the same room, the actual living room format that we had talked about. Um, but also thanks for experimenting with online Google Hangouts and uh, having the conversation here virtually because I think this is also working very well. And, uh, and with that, we'll uh, sign off. Uh, livingroomconversations.org is the website. You can try out your own conversation. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody.